General audience number 37 of August 27th, 1980. In the Sermon on the Mount, Christ says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. To show in what this fulfillment consists, he goes on to the individual commandments and comes also to the one that says, You shall not commit adultery. The last meditation had the aim of showing how the true content of this commandment, willed by God, was darkened by many compromises in the particular legislation of Israel. The prophets, who often denounce in their teaching the abandonment of the true God, Yahweh, by the people, comparing it to adultery, bring out this content in the most authentic way. Not only by words, but as it seems, also by his behavior, Hosea seeks to reveal to us, see Hosea chapter 1 through 3, that the people's betrayal is similar to betrayal in marriage, or even more to adultery practice in the form of prostitution. Quote, Go, take a prostitute for yourself as wife, and have children of prostitution, for the land does nothing but prostitute itself by going away from the Lord. Hosea chapter 1, verse 2. The prophet feels this command in himself, and accepts it as coming from God Yahweh. Quote, the Lord said to me again, Go, love a woman who is loved by another and is an adulteress. Hosea chapter 3, verse 1. For although Israel is, an unfaith, is as unfaithful toward its God as the bride who chased after her lovers and forgot me, Hosea chapter 2, verse 15, nevertheless, Yahweh does not stop looking for his bride. He does not grow tired of waiting for her to turn and come back. And he confirms this attitude by the prophet's words and actions. And on that day word of the Lord, you will call me my husband and will no longer call me my master, my Baal. I will make you my bride forever. I will make you my bride in righteousness and in justice, in goodness and in love. I will make you my bride in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. Hosea chapter 2 verse 18 and 21 through 22. This ardent call for the conversion of the unfaithful bride and wife goes hand in hand with the following threat. Let her remove from her face the signs of her prostitution and the signs of adultery from between her breasts, or I will strip her all naked and expose her as on the day she was born. Hosea chapter 2 verse 4 through 5. The prophet Ezekiel reminds Israel, the unfaithful bride, in even greater measure of this image of the humiliating nakedness of birth. Quote, like a repugnant object you were thrown out in the open field on the day you were born. I passed near you while you were flailing about in your blood, and I said to you, live in your blood and grow up like a plant on the field. You grew up and became tall and arrived at the flower of youth. Your breasts blossomed and you reached puberty, but you were naked and bare. I passed near you again and looked on you. You were at the age for love. I spread the edge of my cloak over you and covered your nakedness. I swore a covenant with you, says the Lord God, and you became mine. I put a ring on your nose, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. You were adorned with gold and silver, while your clothing was of fine linen, rich fabric, and embroidered cloth. Your fame spread among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect due to the glory I placed in you. But you, infatuated with your beauty and profiting from your fame, played the whore and lavished your favors on any passerby. How degraded is your heart, says the Lord God, that you did all these things, the deeds of a shameless whore, building your high place in every square. You were not like a prostitute in search of payment, but like an adulterous wife who instead of her husband receives strangers. Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 5 through 8, 12 through 15, and 30 to 32. Covenant. The quote is somewhat long, but the text is so important that it was necessary to recall it. It expresses the analogy between adultery and idolatry in a particularly strong and, com and comprehensive way. The point of likeness between the two sides of the analogy consists in the covenant accompanied by love. Out of love, God Yahweh makes the covenant with Israel without any merit on its part. For Israel, he becomes a bridegroom and a husband who is most affectionate, attentive, and generous toward his bride. For this love, which has accompanied Israel since the dawn of history, Yahweh the bridegroom receives many betrayals in exchange. 
the high places, so those places of idolatrous worship in which the adultery of Israel, the bride, is committed. See 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 7, and Hosea chapter 10, verse 8. In the analysis we are conducting here, the essential point of the, is the concept of adultery used by Ezekiel. One can say, however, that the situation into which the concept has been inserted in the framework of the analogy is on the whole not typical. Here we are not dealing with the mutual choice made by the bride and the bridegroom, which is born from reciprocal love, but with the choice of the bride, which was made already from the moment of her birth. A choice that comes from the bridegroom's love, which is an act of sheer mercy on the bridegroom's part. The choice shows itself in this way. It corresponds to the part in the analogy that, the, that describes the covenant of Yah Yahweh with Israel. It corresponds less to its second part, which defines the nature of marriage. The mentality of that time was certainly not very sensitive to this reality. For Israelites, marriage was rather the result of a one-sided choice, a choice often made by the parents, but such a situation is hard for us to understand. Leaving aside this detail, it is impossible to overlook. Leaving aside this detail, it is impossible to overlook that the texts of the prophets reveal a different meaning of adultery than the legislative tradition gives it. Adultery is sin because it is the breaking of the personal covenant between the man and the woman. What is emphasized in the legislative texts is the violation of property rights, and in the first place, of the husband's property right to the woman who, though she is his legal wife, is one among many. In the texts of the prophets, the background of effective and legalized polygamy does not change the ethical meaning of adultery. In many texts, monogamy seems to be the only right analogy of monotheism understood in the categories of the covenant, that is, of faithfulness and trust in the only true God, Yahweh, Israel's bridegroom. Adultery is the antithesis of this spousal relation and the opposite of marriage. Also as an institution, inasmuch as monogamous marriage actualizes in itself the interpersonal covenant of man and woman and realizes the covenant that is born from love and welcomed by both parties as a marriage and recognized by such as by society. This sort of covenant between two persons is the foundation of the union by which the man unites with his wife and the two will be one flesh, from Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. In the context mentioned above, one can say that this bodily unity is their right, bilateral, but above all, that it is the regular sign of the communion of persons, of the unity brought about between the man and the woman inasmuch as they are spouses. Adultery committed by either of them is not only the violation of this right, which belongs exclusively to the other spouse, but at the same time a radical falsification of the sign. It seems that the oracles of the prophets express precisely this aspect of, of adultery with sufficient clarity. When we say that adultery is a falsification of the sign, which finds not only its normativity, but rather its simple inner truth in marriage, that is, in the shared life of man and woman who have become spouses, we go back again in some way to the fundamental statements made above, because we consider them essential and important for the theology of the body from the anthropological as well as ethical point of view. Adultery is a sin of the body. The whole tradition of the Old Testament attests to this, and Christ confirms it. The comparative analysis of his words in the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 to 28, as well as various relevant statements in the Gospels and other passages of the Old Testament, allow us to find the real reason for the sinfulness of adultery. It is evident that we find this reason for sinfulness or moral evil by relying on the principle of antithesis to the moral good of conjugal faithfulness, that good which can only be adequately realized in the exclusive relation between the two, that is, in the spousal relation between one man and one woman. The need for such a relationship is proper to spousal love, whose interpersonal structure, as we have shown already, is upheld by the inner normativity of the communion of persons. It is precisely this communion that gives the covenant its essential meaning, whether in the relation between man and woman or, by analogy, in the relation between Yahweh and Israel. One can judge about adultery, about its sinfulness, about the moral evil it contains on the basis of the principle of antithesis to the conjugal covenant understood in this way. We must keep all of this in mind when we say that adultery is a sin of the body. 
The body is here considered in the conceptual connection with the words of Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 that speak, in fact, about the man and the woman who, who unite so intimately with each other that they form one flesh. Adultery indicates the act by which a man and a woman who are not husband and wife form one flesh. That is, those who are not husband and wife in the sense of the monogamy established at the beginning, rather than in the sense of the legal casuistry of the Old Testament. The sin of the body can be identified only in reference to the relationship between the persons. One can speak of moral good and evil according to whether this relationship makes such a unity of the body true, and whether or not it gives to that unity the character of a truthful sign. In this case, therefore, we can judge adultery as a sin in conformity with the act's objective content. And this is the content Christ had in mind when he recalls in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. Yet, Christ does not dwell on this aspect of the problem.